YouTube, what the crap's going on? Air of Carthage here, back in Total War Warhammer 2, but this isn't just any Total War Warhammer 2. Behold, Mortal Empires. So that's right, I've gotten access to an early look at Mortal Empires. This is not actually the release version. This is a, uh, what do you call it, beta testing slash review type build. Um, so it is probably very similar to what you'll see on release, but obviously no guarantee that the final one is exactly I, like I'm it. Tyrion, but heir, I think we have Valerian. reason to believe that they would be close. So this is what the Mortal Empires um, faction selection screen looks like. See, there's a lot of legendary lords up there. I like the way they've laid it out, too. Pretty neat. Where you just got all the uh, icons up at the top. You scroll through, you can select. So this is going to have all the factions represented in the games. So pretty exciting. Where's a chaos and others. So <clears throat> pretty much everything that you want to play through, you can play through. So definitely cool stuff. Um, so yeah, that's all here. And then in the campaign map, we'll go on to a map here in a minute. And I'll show you what that looks like. But I want to head elsewhere and talk. Uh, apparently there's a lot of updates coming too. Um, just a couple of quick things that I noticed whenever I was looking through the game. I have not had this for a terribly long time, so I've only gotten to play a couple hours of campaign. I played as the Empire. Went, it was fun. Um, I mean, I mean, it seemed like everything was working good. Uh, I don't have any like further insight than that now. That I played a couple hours of uh, Empire campaign on that map. Um, let's talk a little bit about some changes that I noticed. So, for instance, um, whenever I was looking at some of the factions like dwarves. Um, Slayers. Didn't these guys cost a thousand? And then, uh, I want to say these Dragonback Slayers got a little cheaper. There's been some price adjustments on a few, on a few units. So it definitely seems like that, uh, some of the units saw a little bit of a price adjustment. I don't know how many, because I haven't gotten a chance to check into it. Also, I noticed that there's been a bit of an item adjustment, too, on some of the Lords. So, like the Silver Horn of Vengeance and this Banner Lord, the, there used to be a Fiery Ring of Thori here. Well, that, that fiery ring is actually now on the engineer. And for instance, the Thane and his items has the Tormentor Sword, which can keep something from moving when he uses it on it for 19 seconds, and it takes away melee attack. The Thane also has an ability that buffs um, the attack of units around it. And the leadership which is pretty cool, because that's its purpose. Look at this. Look at the um, Runesmith. It has this Hammer of Karak Draz which takes away all those uh, added effects there from an enemy. So the runesmiths now potentially even more dangerous than they were. So that's pretty crazy to see there too. Same thing with the rune lord. This may have been here actually, Master Rune, where they got the, yeah, never mind, the rune lord's the same, I think. But just a few interesting changes, like I'll go over and speak to um, beastmen. So when I took a look at Gorbel, for instance, wonder what they changed, if anything, for Gorbel. They give him this Axe of Men. It helps him cause terror. He does fear, but this one will give him terror for 41 seconds and makes him unbreakable. It can only be recharged if you're in melee. Interesting one. And then uh, the Banner of Fallen Kings here. So if his hit points are greater than 50%, then he gets some extra damage. And then if you look at some of the other units in terms of like just standard uh, shamans and wizards and stuff like that. They have different items. So Jagged Dagger instead of the uh, Arc uh, Arcane Conduit, which is pretty similar. And but every faction's just a bit different in that. So like for instance, if I go to Chaos, which Warriors of Chaos, and we take a look at say um, an Exalted Hero. I'm not sure if this Hellfire Sword's the same. It could be. I think this one was, um, but then if we take a look at, say, one of their sorcerers, Forbidden Rod, again, slightly different, causes damage to them, but it lasts longer than maybe an Arcane Conduit, and then they have a Scroll of Shielding still. So not everybody, like, is the same old Scroll of Power, Scroll of Shielding kind of options. They've, they've swapped it up to where the different factions are going to have a slightly different feel to them in terms of some of the things that they have available. I haven't looked at the vampires yet here too, but sort of anti-heroes, I've seen someone else with that. Scroll of Leeching, so taking power away. So again, interesting stuff. I haven't gotten a full look at all the pricing, but I did do a couple of interesting unit tests real quick. 
and although these won't be final, and these are just head-to-head -head tests that don't include lord abilities or spells, and all that stuff is obviously going to play in on the battlefield, but just curiosity's sake. You take um, your High Elves with Dragon Princes. People were curious to see how they stacked up. Dragon Princes were soundly beaten by um, the Bretonian uh, Grail Knights. They were soundly beaten by Blood Knights. They were soundly beaten by Demigriff Knights. Interesting, huh? So people were wondering how that kind of stuff was going to stack up. So how are they priced? Well, they even actually got slightly beaten by Chaos Knights with Lances. So if you look at it, yeah, they stack in kind of where you'd think. The High Elves weren't given a cavalry unit that was meant to be anti-large because their strengths lie elsewhere in their flyers. The High Elves have insane flying units and really good long-range archers and pretty decent low-tier infantry. That's what you get out of the High Elves, so that's what they're meant for. So they don't get a cavalry that does bonus versus large or anti-armor. So although the High Elves may have dominated the cavalry scene within Warhammer 2, they certainly won't dominate it with these other races in now. So interesting to think. Other interesting things to consider. Man, think about being the dwarves in this day and age and the dark elves and people bringing a whole bunch of shades. Yeah, that could get nasty. So probably a good thing that they made slayers cheaper <laughs> or some of the other things that are going to help you get around the map quicker. So it's, it's going to be interesting, folks. There's going to be a bunch of little stuff that we find that's been tweaked. I look forward to seeing a full list from Creative Assembly so we can study it and see if it's what we think it should be. Uh, let's jump into the campaign, though, and let's just give you a feel I tried for, for the what the campaign the map looks like. We'll just jump on to Tyrion here. So you'd be like, "Air, this isn't one of the Warhammer 1 factions. That's true. I'll go jump onto one of their campaign screens just so you can see what, if any, difference there is. So it should load up here in just a moment. We'll show you how big the map is, how far it spans. You should have seen this already if you've been watching the news, but if not, I'll cover it here. You're going to notice that the campaign map is going to look very similar to the uh, Vortex campaign. The only difference is, is you're not going to have the Vortex race up at the top. You're still going to be able to have those fa uh, faction-specific stuff like influence or food or whatever else it is, slaves for the Dark Elves. All that will still play in. Um, but you're you're not going to have the vortex mechanics. You can still do rights if you're playing as the Warhammer 2 races. Uh, though the Warhammer 1 races don't have rights. Who knows? Maybe they'll add that in one day. Never. Hard to say. Uh, but in any case, how big is the map? Well, it's pretty big. If we take a look at it, it goes all the way up here from the north and eastern parts of Nagaron. You can see that we don't get all the way to the western side. And then we don't get all the way to the south and western tips of Lustria. And what is this? The Southlands? I can't even remember the name of this continent, but obviously it doesn't go all the way to the south. And this is the uh, the Badlands and stuff right here, where the uh, Greenskins were. The mountains where we find all the dwarves and so on. Here's Talea, and Astalia, Bretonia, Athelorin, the Empire, Middenland and uh, Nordland, Kislev, Norska. So it's a big map. It spreads all over. It is definitely a huge map. And there's a lot of factions. There is a lot of factions. So yeah, that's kind of what the screen looks like. Let's load it up for um, another faction. We'll exit to the main menu. Campaign, new, Mortal Empires. I am and just for the sake of, we'll load into Karl Franz rocks. and give you all a feel for does it look any difference? No, it doesn't. Now, there are a few key differences to keep in mind. So let's say you're a dwarf player, and you were always frustrated that you had to have a mod to settle uh, r settlements outside of the mountains. That's no longer the case. So the climate-based settlement of the uh, Vortex campaign is now present for every faction. So that's something that's going to be different. You'll see here Altdorf in the green circle, meaning it's a suitable climate. Just to give you an idea... You can actually settle the dwarf settlements up here. They just may not be the most suitable climate. But that's how it handles it. So that's kind of cool. So let's say you're going to play as the dwarves or the greenskins. You're not as limited. There's just penalties for settling places that aren't as open to you, just like we've seen in the Vortex campaign. So pretty good stuff. You'll also notice that the UI is also updated to be more like what we've seen in the Vortex campaign. So your end of turn notifications down here 
Also, up here on the top, your camera controls. All that's going to be the same as it is in the Vortex campaign. So, I command here. my initial impressions of this, it's going to be fun. I really actually like what they've done with the Vortex campaign in the sense that I still want to conquer the people around me, but I have this story I'm going after too with really cool cutscenes. I think that's a really nice addition. But at the same time, I'm kind of glad that, that Creative Assembly brought this giant sandbox into Warhammer 2, and, and it's really cool for a few reasons. One, some people don't like having to chase a story, they just want to do their own thing. And that's been the case in Total War, so that's why I think really cool for Creative Assembly to do this. They didn't have to. The Vortex campaign stands on its own, and it's great. This is just really awesome that they're combining the two games, and the cool thing is, is that if you've spent money on Warhammer 1, that money is still relevant here in Warhammer 2, and you can use that same money to get continued entertainment by playing these same races again so, in the second game on a bigger map against new races with new mechanics and new features. That's awesome. There's nothing bad about that. If you've purchased the Blood and Gore DLC, it carries over to the second game. You don't have to do that anymore. And we know that the third game is going to be similar in the sense that it'll have another mega campaign in it. So, to me, this is really awesome. And my impressions of this is that it plays good. I think Creative Assembly spent a lot of time on it. I think there's some ways that they can polish it up and make it better still. Um, but overall, I mean, I'll tell you what. Like, and I say better still, man, I don't know. I'm like all those people. Don't get me wrong. The map's huge, and I'm really grateful for it. I just wish they could have fit the whole thing in. I don't know what kind of problems they ran into, so I can't say exactly. But, like, for instance, there's a whole bunch of dead space over here on the map that's not usable. It's on there, but then there's settlements down here that we couldn't fit in. I'm sure it's because of the shape of things, potentially. Um, but in any case, stuff like that. Little things that could get polished up. Nothing that I'm going to sit here and, like, take away from the score on them. This was a free update, and it was a massive this update. And it makes, your, um, it makes your game... Uh, or like your Warhammer 1 purchase still relevant. It's not like you spent money on it. Oh, now it's gone. We've rolled out Warhammer 2 and it's over. I, I really think this is cool. I wish more games would do this kind of thing. Where the money I'm spending on a previous game carries over. And it makes sense. And I get to use it. And I get to continue to use it. Emperor. So, I don't know. I'm really excited about it. I think this is going to be a lot of fun to play. Curious to see you all's thoughts. Now, a couple things. One... Go down and check out the comments. I'm going to have a link to a straw poll where you can vote on which faction you want to see me play in the Mortal Empires map. What we'll do is we'll slow down a couple of our Vortex campaigns to do a Mortal Empire campaign. And then, of course, once we start finishing stuff up, we'll go back and revisit those uh, Vortex campaigns. So, for instance, I'm probably going to slow down my Skaven campaign, and we'll see which other. We'll, we'll take care of it. Probably the Skaven campaign for sure. And, uh, but I'll keep the save files, don't worry. I'm going to even save my files up on the cloud now, too, so that they're safe and we can go back to them later. Um, so people are like, you never finish your campaigns. I will. I'll keep the save file. We'll finish it. Don't worry. But anyway, Mortal Empires is awesome. It's a free update, so you got nothing to lose. If you own Warhammer 1, it's going to carry all this stuff over into Warhammer 2 for you. If you've purchased Warhammer 2 and you don't own Warhammer 1, well, who knows? This could be a cool reason to get it. Um, and then you don't you can kind of play it all in one place too and uh, again I think it's pretty cool because it carries over into multiplayer So now in multiplayer all these factions are going to be available So the, the depth of the multiplayer and the free-for-alls um, is going to grow and it's exciting Look at all the factions you have to choose from in multiplayer. It's going to be good times folks should be very interesting I'm interested to see how the new factions square up against the old factions and to see how well CA is doing at balancing this much? I thought their balance, other than some broken Skaven summons, was pretty dang good when the game released. In fact, Warhammer 2 has been in the best shape that I've seen a Creative Assembly game release in, well, ever. It's released in very good shape. Very good shape. Ever since I've been playing them from release, it's the best one, and that goes back to Empire Total War. That was the first one I played on release. Um, so, yeah, definitely doing well, and I have high hopes for this. We'll see how it goes. Definitely hope you enjoy it. Eric Carthage signing out for now, and I'll see you with some Mortal Empires gameplay soon.